Good afternoon and welcome to part two of the Value Methodology webinar series. My name is Hannah Kosanko at Catalyst Connection. Today our presenter, James Bolton, president and owner of Bolton Value Consulting, will be discussing ways to build an international VM program. James Bolton, the president and owner of Bolton Value Consulting, has worked with many organizations globally for 20 plus years to build successful and sustainable internal value methodology programs. In July 2014, Jim began his own value consulting business and has since helped many additional organizations utilize VM and build their own international VM programs. Jim is a past president of SAVE International and is currently the executive director of the Miles Value Foundation. Before we begin the webinar, I would like to remind you all that if there are any questions during today's presentation, please type your question into the chat box or feel free to unmute yourself. With that being said, I will pass it over to you, James. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Hannah, for the introduction. And uh, welcome, everyone, to the second presentation of the uh, Value Mythology series of three. And I'm really happy to be a happy opportunity this afternoon to uh, talk to you about what my real passion is in this field. Uh, I am a little different than a lot of my competitors who would just want to come in and, and kind of fish for you and get you ideas and, you know, help you to develop ideas on how to improve value. But uh, I've kind of built a reputation on being able to help organizations establish their own internal value methodology program because they are usually the experts on their product or process they're trying to develop uh, for clients. And uh, I'm not the expert on every single product or process out there. Uh, so I would prefer to teach the organizations how to build their own internal value management program and use their own people uh, to gain the value out of this methodology. It's been a very powerful methodology. It's been around for 70 years, and uh, it will be a great opportunity to teach organizations how to use this internally. I've done this now for about uh, about 14, 15 years now. I've built uh, more than actually 21 years overall, but uh, uh, 21 years ago, I joined a company called TRW Automotive, which is now ZF, and I built an internal program for them, um, global program. There, it's very sustainable even to this day today, now 21 years later. And uh, did the same thing with Whirlpool Corporation and uh, largest appliance manufacturer in the world. I built a global team for them, uh, and they are now still, still using this process. And since I've been a consultant, I've built teams for four or five different major players around the world to help them utilize this process internally with their own teams to really be successful. So without any further ado, let's get into the presentation. Um, first of all, are there any questions? I'm not sure how many on the phone today or if any of you have had uh, the opportunity to, to look through the first presentation I sent out. Uh, I had an issue I could not uh, meet the first meeting, but um, if any of you have any questions about that, you feel free to uh, unmute your phone. You can ask me any questions right now before, on the first presentation. Uh, that is just kind of the overall overview of the methodology. Does anybody have any questions on the overview of the methodology? Okay. If not, we'll uh, move on. Okay. Um, this uh, presentation is, I'm going to talk about the agenda. If I get my agenda up here, hang on a second, here it goes. Important things to understand up front, uh, how to get an event, a value methodology program started, uh, some of the use of the, the use of the tools, the value methodology tools, how to organize for long-term effectiveness, how to ensure the value management program is sustainable, and questions that I've not answered. So when we cover the first half of this, this presentation and the second half of these um, uh, four through six, we'll talk about those uh, basically in our next presentation. So we'll kind of break into two presentations so that we have the opportunity to understand this material. Okay, so if you're going to build an internal value methodology within your company or organization, uh, some really important things you need to understand up front, they're going to be really variable for you to move forward. First of all, any value methodology program with any organization, whether it be a manufacturing organization, a government organization, a construction-based organization, it needs full cross-functional senior management su support because every aspect of that organization, uh, whether it be the finance department, the accounting, the accounting yeah. design team, the engineering team, the manufacturing team, all those various teams, the quality team, 
they all add or subtract value by what they do every single day. So without cross-functional team support, uh, you're not going to be successful. It has to be support right at the highest level in your senior management team. Because really, you're going to have to pull from their staff to get the needed people uh, to support your workshops, your events. And if they don't support it, then you really not get the value of the guy's methodology. I mean, you can, you can get some value, but you're not getting the really true value because everyone uh, is, has, everyone within your organization has something to do with cost and has something to do, you add or, or, or give value to your, to your customers. So all departments need to be engaged to be successful. Um, that engagement in the projects, they need to be engaged in the projects that's selected for the DM evaluation. Uh, obviously, there's lots of opportunity space. There's lots of different projects or products you could evaluate. Um, and, and when you want to evaluate them, evaluate them in the early design phase, early concept phase. That's the best time to evaluate them so you don't have all that inertia afterwards to try and get, go through and redesign and re-engineer and revalidate. But uh, understand which products you want to go after for first. They need to be engaged to contribute the right team members for the VM study. Again, the team members for the VM study need to be cross-functional from all departments within your company, from the marketing department, sales and marketing, right through to the design team, the manufacturing team, the quality team, the uh, procurement team. They all need to be involved if you're going to really be successful. They need to also be engaged in the management report out meeting after the study is over. So after your study is over, uh, they need to be involved in the, the, the results of that study because the results don't happen. We have some great ideas and some great business cases that need to be developed, need to be um, have feet put to them. There are some great ideas, but we don't want to just have ideas. We want to have those ideas be implementable. And uh, with my process, the at the end of the uh, process, we actually develop what we call project plans. I call them business cases, but they're really project plans as to how to get these like these groups of ideas executed, the things that necess necessary to make them go forward. But the management team needs to buy into those and needs to buy into the resources that can be required to make it happen. So the VM process needs input from all these various teams, obviously from your product design team. Um, obviously, that's very important, product design, but it also Product design is always important as understanding what your customer wants. Voice of the customer is very important. And so if you don't have a good sales and marketing organization that really understands your customer needs, your customer desires, what the marketplace will bear as far as what is important to the customer, things that they value, things that they don't value, things they will things they want to pay for, requirements they're willing to pay for, requirements they're not willing to pay for, that's very important to understand. Uh, and really, and that voice comes of the customer really comes from three different sources, I believe. It comes from the from your distribution network. If you, have, if you have a distribution network, if you sell your stuff to distributors, then you need to understand what their voice is. If it comes from those people who m might shop at the distributor, but they decide to buy someone else's product, understanding what those voices are, why they not, did not buy your product, why they bought the competitor's product. And finally, from the, your customers that actually are your customers that buy your, your product, okay? and why they bought your product, and why they did not buy the competition product. So understanding all those various voices in the marketing part of your organization is very important, and, and understanding the competition landscape. So those are absolutely very valuable. We have to have really the sales and marketing team as part of these workshops. They think, well, I'm not a technical guy. Well, you don't have to be technical to understand what the, what the customer needs, and you have to understand what the customer wants. And that's because how can you design something if you really don't know what is important to the customer? So I really feel that design can't really get started until you understand the voice of customer requirements. Procurement, uh, obviously where you procure your parts, how you procure them, uh, who, who's, where they're gonna be coming from, what supplier, local, overseas, whatever, um, needs to be understood because today it's not just the PO price that is looked at by the final client. He doesn't really care where you get your parts from. That what he does care about is a quality product at the end. And you may have a low PO price, but that may not give the customer the best value because that low PO price might be parts that come from offshore that may have quality issues, they may have delivery issues, they may have manufacturing issues, and now you've got issues to have to get new parts in, redesign parts, uh, and, and high cost and, and flying parts overseas from overseas to get them there in time so you know, ships are lying down, just all kinds of logistic issues. So understanding what really gives your client the best value in procurement is very important. 
So again, it has, the procurement team member needs to be there in your workshop. The manufacturing or the process department needs to be there. The people who are going to be actually manufacturing your product on the, on the, on the, on the manufacturing floor. Design and manufacturing go hand in hand. The manufacturing guys can only design with a desire, can only manufacture what you design. If you've got a poor design, they might have a manufacturing plan based around that poor design. Everybody thinks the design is perfect. Well, I guess the manufacturing floor, your perfect design sometimes falls apart because they have very difficult tolerances to meet, they have uh, process capabilities they can't meet, they have all kinds of tooling issues they can't, they can't meet. So understanding how design and manufacturing go together is very, very critical. So it's very important to have the manufacturing the process guy who actually has to work with your manufacturing design on the floor to manufacture every single day, understand what the issues are, and how that design might be able to be approved to give a better, a better overall value to your client. Um, quality, reliability, obviously those are, those are cost drivers. If you, if you don't have good warranty, if you don't care, it's your suppliers who supply parts you don't have good, uh, if good parts come into you. Uh, those are all quality issues, supplier quality issues. So that all relates to giving your customer the best value uh, and giving your organization the best value. So making sure you understand what those quality issues are, what the reliability issues are up front, is very important. And of course, your finance and your entire costing or your cost estimating team, whatever team you want to call it, your company, but you really need someone that understands the overall cost of the, of the products and and uh, what the burden is, what the overall labor work is, what the overall logistics costs are. And so understand the total uh, bottom line to the company and what really brings profit to the company. So those are all team members you'd like to make sure you have available in the workshop before you start a workshop. And obviously those people from the various departments, and you need that management support to pull people from those organizations. So how are you successful with team engagement? First of all, selecting the selection of the product, product you're going to study. Whatever project you're going to study for the study, whether it be a, a manufactured product or a process, you need to make sure you, you get off to the ground by studying the right product and make sure you have the best one to start with because you have good success the first time, you'll get good visibility and good success thereafter. So you want things you want to consider when you select for project selection. You want to consider longevity, how long is this product going to be in, the, in, the, in production, in the way it's designed right now. Is it two years, three years, five years, 10 years? How long have you had this plan to have this product in production before you make major design changes to it? So that's one thing you want to consider. You also want to consider what the current profit margin is of that product today. Are you really making money on it? And uh, how much money are you making? And is there, is there a good margin? Consider any quality, reliability, quality or reliability issues you may have with that product, either incoming quality issues or warranty issues out in the field, or quality issues going down the assembly line, first time through quality issues. Those are all things that relate to customer quality and, and customer satisfaction and voice to customer requirements. Consider the current potential market share. How good is your market share? Are you a leader in this business or are you just another player? Trying to keep keep up with a, with, a, with a leader, and where where you are you and where do you want to be? Uh, do you want to increase your market share? And uh, so understanding your current potential market share. And as I mentioned earlier, there are three voices of the customer that I think are really important. Um, you need to understand the voice of the distributor, or the marketing outlet that sells your product or process out in the field. Hopefully, maybe not everyone, but some people have the distribution organizations that sell their help sell their products, and sometimes the distribution organizations also will sell the competitor's product. So getting that voice to the customer is very, very important to understand what the customer really needs, why the customer why is buying your product to your distributor, or why your customer maybe is buying the competitor's product, why he's buying the competitor product, why, what, 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 product, what capabilities does that product offer that your use doesn't, that the customer wants. Understand the voice of the customer, the voice of the shopper. The shopper is the one who shops in the marketplace but decides to buy the competition product, does not buy your product for whatever reason, or your process for whatever reason. So he buys the competitor product. Why did he buy the competitor product? What, 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 what do you see in that product? Was it just price or was it quality? Was there other issues that he saw that was an advantage to him? Understanding what those advantages are will help you to reevaluate re your product. And finally, the voice of the consumer. That's the one who does, in fact, buy your product. And we question, why did you buy that product? Why did you buy my product? Why did you, why did you not buy the product? What did we offer you that was important to you 
understanding what those issues were is really helpful. So again, those are all the things you want to consider and understand before you select a product up front. You understand those voices. So how are you successful with team engagement? First of all, you want to select team members for the study that uh, want to consider selecting the best team member. It's not just that person that's available, not the designer that might be available that week, it, but you really want the designer that's available, that's responsible for designing that product, or, was, or did design that product, or was in the process of designing that product. You want the guy who has ownership, who has, we, as we call it, has skin in the game. He really needs to understand and, and knows that product better than anybody else. People with the right experience for the product being studied. That's very important. The one who has, who be open to accepting new ideas. Not everyone is real open to accepting new ideas. No one wants to have their design or their process uh, evaluated or torn up because maybe they, they felt they did a good job the first time. Not everybody, no one wants to do a bad job. No one tries to do a bad job. But if you don't understand all the voice of the customer requirements, you know, don't understand what the customer really wants, sometimes you may design something that the customer doesn't, doesn't value, and uh, you may build a, a, design, a manufacturing process for something the customer doesn't value. So understanding those things up front is very important. The one who is a, wants to be a team player and can listen, uh, this is all about communication and being open to other people's ideas. Understanding most organizations I work with are very siloed, you have the procurement department that does their job, tries to get the best price for everything. You have the engineering department that tries to get the best design. You have the manufacturing people trying to get the best process. You try to have the quality team try to get the best quality. But trying to get the, what the customer wants is the best value. And having those team players work together as a team is what's really important. The one who doesn't maybe doesn't have time to do maybe no one has time to take us out to be involved in a three or four day study. But will overachieve to overcome that loss of time. They will, they will work off hours or whatever they do, that they'll overachieve. And that's what you want is people are willing to overachieve that, that they may don't have the right time, but are the right people for this study. I just don't select anybody just because they're available. The one who's not available, but will excel in spite of it. The one who is most inquisitive and willing to take risks. The one who's not willing to just follow the status quo. And the one who is innovative and has a free spirit. Is, is going to be thinking outside the box. If you don't, aren't willing to think outside the box, then you're not going to probably be a very uh, ambitious team member to work with other ideas that come up. And it's the very methodology is all about understanding uh, products and processes and procedures in, manner, in terms of functions. And when you look at things in a functional point of view, it gives you a whole new opportunity space to open up new ideas rather than just thinking about, well, how else can I what other kind of compressor can I use? What other kind of um, uh, equipment motor can I use? You know, if you think about a motor, you're always thinking about a motor. Maybe you won't think about the options to what options to the motor there are, what options to the compressor there might be. So thinking about in terms of functions is really important. So how to be successful with team engagement? Okay, you want to attain the management problem. It's important that you have the management team that is, again, uh, other Every team member that's on your study, their manager should be invited to your management report on me. Consider selecting a team member who can, first of all, encourage and study and encourage the study team for work done in the ABM study. You want the management team to, to encourage the work that's been done. You make it come out with some great results at the end of your three or four day study, but you want a management team that's going to be able to support those ideas. If you got a manager who doesn't think there's any need for improvement, then probably he's not going to have much value in why I come and support your meeting. Has the knowledge to access resources needed when implement, for implementation. So your management team, the reason we have the management part of meeting at the end of the workshop is we want to make sure that the management team understands that without their support, these ideas aren't going to go anywhere. They need to have cross-functional support from the procurement department, from the design department, from the processing department, maybe the quality department, procurement department, every person on that team will have some responsibilities to get these ideas implemented. So getting the management team to, to pull those resources when you need them is important. They will go to bat for the study team to obtain the resources. And what I mean by that is sometimes you're going to need some financial resources. You may need $100,000 for a new tool, or a new, new mold, or $200,000 for a new press, or whatever it happens to be. There may be some financial resources you need to make your process better, make your product better. But you need to make sure you get those resources. If you don't get the resources you need, 
then you're not going to implement those ideas. So a management team member who can go to bat and get those resources for you to help you be successful with your project is very important. It won't jump to conclusions until the results are fully vetted, fully explained. As many times I see that the management team has already got their, their head on, they know what they want to do, and don't change my mind, you know. But we really need to get the management team to also be open to some nuanced ideas because maybe there just might be a better way to build this mousetrap. It might just be a better way. Their manufacturing process, their logistical process, their, their supply team, supply, supply process, logistically or whatever to, to improve our quality, improve our quantity, uh, improve our market share. And uh, so op it's open to, I mentioned it's open to new ideas. It's going to be very important and won't just jump to conclusions. We'll take care in helping the team uh, add potential missing items. Uh, there may be some items that are missing that you may not have all the data you need. And pulling that data out, getting the, in the pre-workshop, the certain data is required for each of these workshops we do. And if you don't have the data, you don't have to have a good workshop. So who's the management team member who's willing to get that, uh, that cost of bill material, the management team member who's way to get that uh, uh, logistic supply team, uh, the supplier logistics uh, pulled together that understands where the parts are coming from, how often they're coming, are they coming by truck, what, what kind of, are they coming in returnable, non returnable containers? All, all the information is very important as you go through and do a value study. So those business items are important. We'll be open to new ideas, contrary to the status quo. You know, obviously, we are all are an example of our overall background. We do what we know how to do because we've done it before. But just because we've done it before doesn't mean that's the best way to do it. There may be opportunities to do things differently. So we want to be open to those new opportunities. We'll lend support to remove roadblocks if they occur. And there will be, there'll always be roadblocks for every new idea. There will be some advantages, there will be some challenges. And we understand how to overcome those challenges to, to, to capitalize on those advantages is very important. And finally, to congratulate the team once the idea is implemented. Because you will have success. You will have ideas to get implemented. I have never had a workshop yet when the ideas were not able to be implemented. They may take a year, some may take six months, depending upon, some may be done, done in three months, depends upon the idea and how deep, much work has to be done, how much redesign has to be done. I've had teams execute ideas in three months. I've had other teams actually take six months, sometimes a year to execute an idea. But it all ends up to the bottom line at the end. So how do you get started? Okay, get started with excellent planning. When you plan a workshop, you need at least two weeks prior to when you want to have the workshop to pull the team together and get all the necessary data pulled together, or at least have the team work on getting that data pulled together prior to the workshop, because there's a lot of data that needs to be pulled together. So you can't just do this today and expect the workshop to happen tomorrow. It's you just need, you need preparation time. A well-structured pre-workshop checklist really helps with that planning. A pre-workshop meeting needs to be attended by all the members of the value site. So if you've got eight people on your team from different parts of your organization, they all need to be in that pre-workshop meeting because each one of them will have an assignment to do. Do that now when the workshop starts. They've got a couple weeks to do that assignment. And if that assignment is not completed, you're not going to be very successful in doing your workshop. Those assignments to each, very, to each of the site team members need to be completed prior to the actual workshop itself. I require all those assignments to be sent to me or to be sent to whoever's leading the study to make sure that they are completed. And I refused or delayed studies if the information wasn't there. You really got to put your, a solid foot down to make sure you have the information you need. Otherwise, you're not going to have a very successful study. That's not going to be what you need, want it to be. So make sure that the assignments are I've given out at least a couple weeks in advance so you give the team members time to get the work data collected. Once it is collected, I put it all together in a big electronic package big electronic PDF package, which I distributed to all the team members. So the following pages are some of the pre-workshop meeting files that I use. First of all, this is the people that need to be involved in any kind of a uh, manufacturing or process-related workshop. They need certain you know, manufacturing engineer be, the product design engineer be available, uh, mechanical or electrical, maybe both, uh, the technical or project leader, the finance or uh, tire cost representative, quality or reliability engineer, manufacturing engineer, your marketing team, procurement team, those are key team members you need. If you have a competitive benchmarking organization within your company, it'd be great to have that person be part of the team. 
or if you have a, a lean or industrial engineering specialist in your company, it would be great to have them be part of the team. So those are the various team members that every team really needs to have to be successful. So how do you get started? Okay, this is a typical agenda. This is for a uh, four-day study, all right? But actually, actually, this fourth day is a certification day, so actually the study is, is three days. And the last day is going to certify the people. So here, we, in this study, you see that we go to each of the six phases, it's a six-step job plan, all right? In the morning of the first day, we do our information phase. We may do some competitive analysis at the same time, okay? We make sure all the team members understand the information, objectives, the marketing, the supplier review, all the information is understood up front by all the team members, because some of the team members may know some of the information, but may not all the team members know all the information, and they really need to be aware of all the information. In the afternoon of that first day, we start our, our second phase of the workshop, which is the function analysis phase. We spend a whole afternoon looking at functions, uh, building a fast diagram of uh, your, your product or process, understanding how those, how, those, how those functions relate to each other, what the highest cost functions, we prioritize those functions by cost. So at the end of the day, the first day, we prioritize all your functions by from highest to lowest cost. Which function is costing your company the most amount of money? The following day and the next day of the workshop, day two, we will start evaluating those ideas or creating ideas by function. Okay, so we'll create ideas by function and then we'll spend the whole morning creating ideas by function, not just randomly by part or piece or proportion, but by what, how, what's another way to achieve that function? So that function might be able to be achieved in a number of ways in your industry or other industries. I had a workshop uh, about a year ago that as a consultant uh, on a airbag system that uh, we're just studying the bag itself, not the inflator, just the bag. And uh, we talk about what's what's the main, what was what one of the functions of the airbag? Well, you have to join material. Right? It's different types of material have to join an airbag. Some of it's very heat resistant, uh, so it's not so heat resistant, it has to, has to be able to blow up at, to a, at a very fast rate um, and then when the igniter goes off. But they say, okay, we're trying to uh, join uh, join material, all right? So how some of the ways we join material? Well, one of the guys in the, in the study said, you know, right now, today, every single person out there in the industry joins airbag material with thread, stitching. So you go down any, any, any semi line and any airbag manufacturing facility in the, in the world today, and you'll see that all their airbags are stitched together with thread. One of the ideas that came out of the workshop, well, you know, how many people have raincoats? How many threads do you have in your, in your raincoat? If you have a good quality raincoat today, you don't have any threads in it whatsoever. All those, because threads are, are water leakage points. If you have a good, good resistant raincoat, it has no threads to it. it all the seams are bonded together or heat staked together uh, just by heat staking the material to itself. And uh, that is the way that they suggested, maybe, well, can we do the same thing with airbags? Well, that had not been done, but they called in during the study, and uh, actually one of the guys in the study called the manufacturer of the, of the sewing machines, and guess what? They also make machines that uh, sew, uh, they don't sew, but actually bond material together for, um, for, for the clothing industry. And uh, so they started putting together a patent uh, for potential idea to actually bond material together with uh, by heat staking it or sonically staking it together versus using thread and if that's successful, I haven't heard yet, but, but that would be, say, it's millions and millions of dollars uh, doing that, and maybe the, maybe the first ones in the industry to do it. So it's a great potential idea of how I think in terms of functions that had nothing to do with, with thread at all, but had to do with how do you join material. And that's, if you think in terms of functions, there's lots of ways to join material that may have nothing to do with sewing thread with a sewing machine and bobbins and so on and so forth. So anyhow, we create ideas, and then after we create ideas, we go to evaluate those ideas in the afternoon on the second day. After that, we go into our third, our fifth phase of the workshop, which is the development phase. You develop ideas through the development of business cases. And then at the end of the day, on the third day, you put together a management report out meeting with all these various business cases, put the management team come in, review them with you, and hopefully they will give priorities to those ideas and get those ideas it will help you to get those ideas and you can support those ideas and better. So that's the six step job plan. And I do it in three days, three or four days, depending upon the length of time you want to spend in, in information, in uh, creative, in competitive analysis and in, in developing some of these ideas. But uh, normally three or four days is sufficient to uh, to do a value engineering study. Okay, what are some of the things you want to pull together? 
Now, these are some of the things you want to pull together for event engineering study. You want to make sure you have um, everyone's agreed about the date and time of the study. Okay, so everybody, why everybody to make sure they have it on the calendar, they can be there. You have to have the right people there, the committed person, the right committed person uh, committed to be there. Uh, make sure they're available for every phase of the workshop. It was a three-day study. They have to be there for all three days, morning and afternoon, because the, it, because this is doing a block process. What we do in the morning on the first day, we use in the morning, the afternoon of the first day. What we do in the afternoon of the first day, we use in the morning of the second day. So if someone misses a half a day of the workshop for two or three hours, in fact, you're going to really not understand the process, not really understand why, what we're doing, what, why we're, what we're trying to do. So getting those team, team members there for all three, three full days of a four-day workshop, I know it's tough, but that's what's required. You really want to get the best value. So getting those people to commit to that time, getting their management team to commit to that time. That's why you need the management team member to, team to really support this event up front, get their support. Um, then to make sure you have uh, computer projectors, uh, you, I would take my own or have them in the room, or now you have all these uh, flat screen TVs, whatever, but however you want to project to the room. Um, understand your quality target versus current cost. Where are you today? I, where where do you want to be in the marketplace? Do you, are you satisfied with your cost? Do you want to improve by 5, 10, 15% to be more competitive in the marketplace? So understanding what, the, what your target cost should be compared to where you are today. And your quality target. I want to make sure every team before I get started gives me a, a cost target and a quality target. There's probably very few events I go through that you have the best quality in the world. There's always something that can be improved. Either the suppliers can improve something, they can improve something in-house, or they can improve the warranty out of the field. So I want to have those targets understood so that we try to seek to uh, know if we're successful at the end of the workshop. If we, we don't set targets, how you know the workshop is successful? I always want to have targets for the workshop. So. Um, I always encourage the teams to make sure those targets are well established, well understood. So at the end of the workshop, the end of three or four days, we know if we met those targets. Review the supplier logistics, so supplier internal warranty items. Um, what's your supplier quality items? Well, logistically, where are the parts coming from, how they're getting there, how often, when, quality issues. So understand all your quality issues and supplier issues. Some sample components, drawings, make sure you have the right drawings you need there, uh, process drawings, component drawings. Process labor routings, understanding step by step what every operator is doing, how, we, how much content do they have in each step of the job, a tool, tool and maintenance reports, how often do all the equipment maintained, and, uh, and what is your PM program, maintenance program for that. Supplier logistics, understanding again uh, where parts, who, who is making what, which part. Do you have multiple suppliers for some of your parts? Or do you just have one supplier for your parts? Understanding. Which parts come from where and, and whom and how often and by what method, by truck, by rail, and uh, by corrugated boxes or by return containers. A design for manufacturing, a DFMA, a PFMA would be very helpful. Design for more analysis, process for very more analysis. If your organization does those, have those at re as reference, it's very important to have those. Selection of parts for competitive teardown. If you have a competitive teardown during your event, which that should just be very valuable to do. Did you know which competitor you want to look at? Maybe you're going to have a chance to look at one or maybe two at the most, but get those parts available ahead of time. Make sure that everybody agrees, your marketing agrees, those, those are the right parts to compete, that compete against your product, and get those at the workshop. And then marketing team strategy. This is uh, your marketing report on competitors and future strategy. Where are you today? Where do you want to be? What's your competition doing differently than you? What are you doing different than competition? Some trends, consumer desires, for the voice of the customer, what's the customer really asking for? What does he care about? What's important to him? Uh, completed QFD, house of quality items, based on the voice of the customer. What quality level is he willing to pay for? Uh, what, is he, what does he need? What's important to him? And understanding what, uh, what, what, is, what is important um, and what, what, he, what, he, what, he, what he does really value. And then having a manager problem, you know, in that established ahead of time, making sure that the, we set an invitation at least two weeks in advance to the management team so they're physically we get that booked on their calendars a couple weeks in advance so they can come to the product meeting uh, and support you. So understanding those details is very important. Okay, so um, next we've got um, a slide that shows um, just uh, a potential bill material. And this is not just a regular bill material. This is what I call an extended bill material, with process and materials. In other words, here we've got, um, this is for a, uh, a tooled 
uh, manufactured uh, uh, manufactured uh, rack and pinion system for a steering system for a vehicle. And uh, this is a rack, rack piston, and it comes in as, as green machined. Uh, it not only tells you what the part is, the part number, what the part is, but also tells you what the material is, okay? And what the cost per pound is of that material, and what your first process cost is, okay? So what, your, what that material cost, what that, what the, as a rough casting, what does that part come into you from your, from your casting? If you, it, or you cast it in house. What's the rough cast cost in house of that cast part, okay? Without any machine, without any holes being drilled in, without any machine being done, what's that cost? Then you're going to add some, maybe some heat treat. Well, what's the cost of that heat treat? Okay, we'll add that cost. Then after your heat treat, you're going to have some finished machines. Maybe you have a bunch of holes you got to drill. You got to machine some surfaces, make them smoother, whatever. You have some finished machines. So understanding what your finished machine costs are. In this case, your finished machine is almost as expensive as your heat treat and your, in fact, your heat treat and machine together is almost as expensive as your initial casting. So Understanding your total cost of part in this broken down way is very important. It's not just what the cost part cost comes into your factory, but what's the cost of that so that it's usable to your final customer, which might include heat treating, uh, other finishing, maybe call it maybe some plating, in fact, after, even after that one, some, maybe some plating, uh, some other things. So understanding that this, this next one is a machine has to take place and it has to be plated, and then also chrome, nickel chrome plated. So that's why I like to have bill materials uh, sent to me so we understand not just what the initial part is, but then all the subsequent parts of that process, whether it's done in-house or it's done by your supplier. Okay, next. If I get to the next slide, yeah, there it goes. All right, um, so this is the breakdown of what goes on on your manufacturing floor. Okay, this is your process routing sheet, or whatever you want to call it, your company. But basically, it's broken down by what happens from the time your parts are unloaded from the truck, your parts from your supplier, unloaded from the truck, going into your product, uh, in your process. Uh, and and I, I call it a, it's a, more, it's a store, move, inspect, wait, process study. So it basically understands how much of your process is actually spent in just moving parts and storing parts, and inspecting parts, and waiting wait time. Sometimes all these things, except for process time, are really not a value added. Okay, all your store time and your move time, your inspection time, your wait time, is really not a value added to your customer. So obviously, you want to try and minimize that time and focus on your process time, because that's where you're really transforming the part from one part to a different part. You're machining it, you're assembling it. Whatever you're doing, you're actually making valuable contributions that the customer want to pay for. The customer really care for about want to, wants to pay for your part by just storing it someplace, or moving it from point A to point B, or inspecting it, or waiting for it. He doesn't, he doesn't want to pay for those things. He wants a good quality part at the end. How you do that, it's your, your responsibility, but that's all part of the process. Next one is your supply logistics review. Okay, this is understanding again uh, whether where your parts. Uh, who's, who the supplier is, where the location is, how are they coming to you, by truck or by rail, uh, transportation cycle, is it daily, every six days, twice a week, twice a day, how often is they, are they coming, transportation time, are they coming every four hours, are they coming six hours, it takes four hours to get there to your plant, it takes six hours, it takes 20 minutes, or does it take four weeks going across the ocean, okay? So understanding uh, your transportation time is very important. And how are those parts coming to your factory? Are they coming to it in corrugated containers, cardboard boxes, or are they coming in returnable containers? Or you wooden boxes, but are the wooden boxes not, sometimes wooden boxes even are not returnable, okay? So they have to be, but they are returnable, that's fine. But understanding are they returnable uh, or not returnable? All right, these are the very six steps that we use in the job plan. We start off with the pre-study itself, which is uh, understanding all those inputs that I talked about, your cost inputs, your plant inputs. Your plant inputs is all your manufacturing floor, understanding all, all your plant inputs, your, your quality inputs, your marketing inputs, understanding your, um, what the customer needs, voice the customer needs, your manufacturing plan, uh -huh. uh, parts you, you use, um, your procurement, Input, all your procurement inputs, manufacturing inputs, benchmarking inputs, 
all that input, we get all the input done ahead of time, at least a couple weeks before the study, minimum, minimum two weeks before the study, okay? Once all the data is collected, we go to our information phase. This is the, what happens actually during the workshop, right? Oops, what happens during the workshop itself here. Oops, try this again here. Okay, in this in this block here, one through six, this is what these are the six steps of the VM workshop itself. The first step is your information sharing. You, inf you share all the information that you gather two weeks in advance, up to two weeks in advance, with the whole team. So everybody on your team knows that what information is needed. Everybody has the opportunity to review the information, ask questions, and make sure they're familiar with the information. After that, you go to the function analysis phase. This is the phase that makes this process different than any other process out there. There's no other process that uses function analysis. Thinking in terms of functions, getting your team to think in creative terms of functions, active verb measurable noun format. And when they think in terms of functions, they may think totally different about your product or process than they would if they didn't think in terms of functions. So doing function analysis, from function analysis, we all go to the creativity phase but we create ideas by function, by those prioritized functions. We have, if you've got 25 functions, we prioritize those 25 functions from highest cost to lowest cost. We may not get every one of them evaluated by function in the creativity phase, but certainly you want to get the highest cost ones at first. If you've got uh, uh, five or six functions, there are 80% of the total cost of all your functions. If you can get through those first five or six, you can have 80% of the cost already understood. So gain through those first highest cost functions by, by, by first. It's kind of the Pareto analysis, Pareto rule. We try and look at your overall function, from a functional point of view, and how many of those functions contribute the biggest percentage of, of cost to your product. Look at those functions first in your creativity phase. After we go to the creativity phase, we go to our evaluation phase. We don't really evaluate the ideas, we prioritize them into uh, potential groups that will go into our business case development phase. So what groups of ideas, that Maybe some groups of ideas that can be implemented maybe in a very short window, two months. Another group of ideas that can be implemented in six months. Another group of ideas that can be implemented in nine months or, or one year. So I group them in different groups like that because if there's some ideas you can you can execute in three months, why wait for a year to execute? Let's get them done in three months. We got another group that takes six months. Let's get those ideas. They may be smaller savings, not as much money, but if I if my company can get some smaller savings quicker, that still helps the bottom line of the company. So. Uh, that's why I group them into different groupings by by quarter rate, basically about three months, six months, nine months, 12 months. That's where we view those business cases at the management meeting at the end, and we'll have a whole bunch of business cases, hopefully, that will be in three month area, some in six months, some in nine months, some in one year. It'll be the management team responsibility to decide that maybe they can't resource all those business cases. They have to decide which ones they want to resource. They want to go after the quick wins, ones that can do in three or four months. Or are the ones that wait a few more months and get the ones that have a bigger opportunity space, but may take six to nine months or a year to do. So that's that's why I want them there at that management department to help us decide where, which what the priority is, how soon we want the savings, and are they willing to wait to get bigger savings down the road? Because obviously, every organization resources are usually limited. After that, there'll be a decision point. Okay, is there some ideas that will be implemented, implemented and, and, and got to the product floor. Other ones I say dropped here, but they really not dropped. What they've done is they put into a hopper for the next new product development product, uh, NPI, the new, new, new product introduction. So we can't maybe do it right now because it's too much inertia. There's too much, too much redesign has to take place, too much uh, uh, revalidation has to take place. But next time you develop a similar product, those are, those are when you pull those ideas out. So they put into a, uh, not a drop floor, but I'm going to say an active to do folder for the future where new products are developed. The ones that can implement will have results. And they'll be, again, the results could be anywhere from three to six months to a year. But that's, that's, that takes place in the post workshop activity as a team works with these ideas and gets, them, gets the action plan developed, implemented. Okay, so the information we're going to collect. Uh, and, and during the information phase, the first phase of our workshop is we're ready to, I always start off with the marketing information because if you don't know what your customer really wants, what they value, what they don't value, what's important to them, what's not important to them, uh, then how can you design really any product or process? You really need to know what the customer wants and what he's willing to pay for it and what he is, he expects. Okay, so what's the customer and performance requirements are very, very important, okay? So I always start with that because 
uh, having a good marketing team that really understands these ideas and these concepts is very important. Okay, competitive analysis. If we're going to do competitive analysis in the study, understand your competitors, uh, understand what your competitors offers. We can actually do a teardown for in the study for about an hour. We have time to do a teardown. I like to also try to do a plant walk as well. So maybe a chance to do both in only a three-day study. But depending upon what your organization feels is the most beneficial, you will either do a competitive analysis or a plant walk. If we have an extra day, a fourth day, we can do both. Okay. So the extended cost of bill material, financial breakdown, uh, that's uh, very important to understand what what were your costs today, what by component, by component, uh, processing cost, packaging costs, understand all that data. Current materials, the type of manufacturing process used, uh, sample components, either functional or non-functional. Drawings, product specifications, find element analysis work that has been done or should be done. Supplier and quality input, supplier and internal plant quality issues, uh, warranty issues. So again, understand your supplier issues because guess what, guys? There's no free lunch out there. If your supplier has quality issues, and he's only saying you half of his parts because he has major issues. Believe me, he, you're paying for all of them. You're just getting a higher price on the, on the, half, on the half you're paying for that you're getting. So understanding what your issues your supplier are, what you can do to help reduce his costs and his issues because those those rejects, although they may be rejected in your plant, you're still paying for them. So what can we do to make sure the supplier is, is has very few rejects at his location so you're paying for a very few number of rejects? Internal plant quality, very important, okay? What's your first time through quality? Is it, are you 95%? Are you 98%? Are you 80%? Okay. How many, how many parts do you have to rework at the end of the semi line or resage? Re any warranty issues? What's your field returns? Do you have any field returns? Are there any issues out in the field? Is your customer 100% satisfied with your box in the field? So I understand those issues. They all relate to cost, they all relate to customer satisfaction, and they all have to do with value. Product lower competitiveness, benchmark review. Again, understand who your best competitors are out there. Supplier footprint, understanding where your parts are coming from, uh, how they're getting to you, where they're coming from, and from whom, how often, and what, what kind of what kind of cartons are they shipped in. Design framework analysis, and and uh, that's all we're going to do today. So we're going to, we're going to work on the use of the tools at our next workshop, next next seminar. But I wanted to at least give you a, a starting point because. These things are very important to get started with your workshop, and if you don't understand the basics, then you're really not going to have a very successful internal program. Um, so uh, I guess I'd like to open up for any questions right now. If anyone has any questions about any material I, I went over, I can back up and go to certain slides if you've got any questions. So if anybody on the phone want to unmute and ask me a question, you're welcome to do so at this point. Thank you, James. Does anyone have any questions? I can give you a few seconds to ask them or type them in the chat feed. Is Ray on the phone? <laughs> Okay, if any further questions come to mind, feel free to contact us here at Catalyst Connection and we can work with James and the Bolton Value Consulting team to get you some answers. Don't miss out on part three of the Value Methodology webinar series on October 18th as James will provide a detailed overview of the proper use of the VM tools during the six-step VM job plan. Please visit the Catalyst Connection website for more information and to register. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Hannah.